I would now like to introduce our speaker, my good friend, Orion Hopper, and a brief bio about Orion. So Orion's a longtime friend of the society. We've all known him here um, as Ma Marianne Claxton's partner for over 20 years. He's been a friend of the society. And three years ago, he finally joined, yay. <laughs> and has been very active in um, our social action committee. He's the loving partner of Marianne Claxton, who has been a member of our community since the early days, the 1960s. Um, Orion was born in the latter part of the baby boom years to parents who were well-educated and devoted to public service and social justice. His father, a Presbyterian minister, was active in the civil rights movement. And during the 1967 Newark riots, as a clergyman with a long familial involvement in Newark, he was one of the people who persuaded Governor Hughes to remove the National Guard, thereby de-escalating the tensions there. Some of you might remember those riots. It's a terrible time. Um, also, Orion was one of the first students bused to integrate schools in the early 60s in Highland Park, Michigan. For one year during high school in East Orange, Orion joined the Black Heritage Club. He notes that regrettably he did not learn any of the material that he'll be discussing here today, but due to his strong interest in social justice, he has developed an interest in the issue of reparations and is thus well read on this topic. Orion is currently retired from his nearly four decade career in sales of audiovisual equipment and is currently very active in our social action committee. In addition to his interest in reading about politics, working to save democracy in America, reversing global warming, <laughs> big job, <laughs> that's what you're doing in retirement, right? In your spare time. And of course, social justice issues. Orion also enjoys good food, fine wine, gardening, and spending time with Marianne family and friends. So I'm now going to turn it over to Orion. And thanks, Orion, for taking Thank us you, on. Lisa. Lisa neglected to mention that today is the uh, summer session uh, social action committee, committee uh, gathering. So that's why, why she's here as the chair of the uh, Social Action Committee, and, and I was silly enough to volunteer to make this, uh, this speech. So, yep, you're welcome. So uh, good morning. Nice to see everybody today. Um, I'm very honored that there are so many people here in the audience and, and online to, to hear me speak. This is, uh, this is very reassuring. Um, as Lisa said, I'm a, a retired technologist, and I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a, an anthropologist or an economist or a social scientist or a political scientist or philosopher. I'm simply a concerned citizen uh, with a long history of, of involvement in civil rights issues. Um, I was an eager participant here at the Society in uh, Jesse, uh, Janet Glass's uh, series called Hidden, uh, what, Being White and Its Hidden Assumptions. And I see today's conversation as just an outgrowth of, of that, that whole thing. And the whole topic of today's uh, was prompted by a news article that, that hit the, the press in the spring about San Francisco um, studying and agreeing to work on reparations for, for some of their black citizens. And uh, we discussed it in, in social action and decided this would be a good topic for this platform. And, and then, as I said before, I was silly enough to volunteer. So I, I was never in the military, so I didn't learn to step back. So in uh, journalistic parlance, uh, who, what, where, when, and why of, of reparations? What, what, what's going on? So uh, who are we talking about? And for purposes today, we're talking about the descendants of the enslaved um, people of the United States of America. Um, and that's uh, about 45 million people, um, arguably about 
90% of them have back some direct lineage back to, to slavery. Um, you could also extend that to everyone of African American descent, um, just by virtue of almost all of them have suffered some form of discrimination at some point in their lives. So, but we're, we're, we're focusing on the, the people who were actually involved in the slave trade and slavery. So uh, what are reparations? Well, according to the uh, UN's International Human Rights Conventions, uh, it involves restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction, which they define as a cessation, stopping the harm, verification and public disclosure, disclosure uh, identification of the victims, uh, an official declaration or judicial decision restoring the reputation, dignity, and human rights of the victims, uh, and a public apology acknowledging the facts and accepting responsibility, and finally, a guarantee of non-repetition. So that, that's, that's how the UN regards the whole concept of reparations. So where? Well, we're talking about here in the United States, although arguably this is an international problem, an international issue, and in fact the African Union is, is uh, talking about pursuing reparations against the, the original participants of the slave trade, which means it was started by the Portuguese and then expanded by the Dutch and ultimately turned into a really big business by the British. So. When? Well, it's now, or at least soon. The things are happening already, and uh, the Congress has been talking about authorizing a study since John Conyers raised the issue in the 1990s. Uh, however, it's never gotten out of committee. They talk about it, but they don't do anything about it. Um, he, he calls the bill H.R. 40, and that's a reference to the 40 acres and a mule uh, concept that was, goes back to the beginning of the Reconstruction era, right after the Civil War. Major cities like San Francisco have launched studies to explore the concept and in, indeed um, their, their study group has written a report and the, the, the s um, supervisors of the city of San Francisco will be voting on, on those recommendations in September. Uh, the state of California has just finished its study, a monumental study. The, the final report is over a thousand pages, a thousand eighty pages. And the executive summary is, is a measly 74 pages. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that executive summary because I think it's very illustrative of, of what we're concerned with and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, our neighbors across the river in New York have uh, recently, the legislature has recently voted to study reparations, uh, passed both houses of, of their legislature. Um, however, for some reason, Governor Hochul has not yet signed it. Um, I, I haven't heard why. Um, and then we have individual cities like uh, Greenwood, Florida, and Evanston, Illinois, and, and Manhattan Beach, California, um, where, where Ron and Lisa have actually seen the plaque <laughs> at the park that uh, uh, talks about how the family that originally owned these lands and had it stolen from them um, was given back the property, and then the city bought the property from them to turn it into a park. So it was a win-win-win for everyone involved. So things are happening. It's already happening in, in various sites across the country. So the big question is, of course, why? And this is the $14.7 trillion question. Uh, for those of you who are paying attention with economics, that's roughly half of U.S. gross domestic product for one year. So it's, it's a big number. Uh, but I'm not going to focus just on the number, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, the international slave trade dates back to the 1400s. It, as I said, was started by the Portuguese um, and then amplified and extended by the Dutch and the British. Uh, and there's an awful lot of modern wealth that is still attributable to that triangle trade. It's amazing how many rich and famous people are, got their start by trading in human flesh. Uh, African nationals were captured um, either by Europeans or by other tribes, and then they were marched to the, to the shore um, and, and housed in slave prisons 
uh, before they were sent across the water to the, the New World. Um, slavery first started in the United States, or actually in the colonies, in 1619, which uh, becomes the origin for uh, uh, Hannah and Nicole uh, Smith's um, books to the 1619 Project. And uh, by the time abolition took hold here in the United States and the Emancipation Proclamation was issued by Lincoln, there were over four million uh, enslaved Americans. Four million. It has been documented that at least one million human beings died during that transatlantic voyage, which is referred to as the Middle Passage. The, the conditions on those slave ships were absolutely ab abysmal. Um, and I'm not going to get into the horrific details of slavery today. I, this is not the time or the place to, to discuss those, those issues. Many of them are known, but you know, if you want to know about slave ships, then watch Spielberg's Amistad. You'll have a, a real good example. Um, suffice it to say that the loss of freedom, loss of family, loss of language, loss of culture and religion are just the beginning of, of the why of reparations. Uh, long working hours under grueling conditions with only the most rudimentary provisions of food and shelter, fear of separation from loved ones, and the fear of rape and murder were entrenched in the lives of the enslaved. It was, it was just a brutal system. Uh, we might have hoped that the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution, um, which were ratified between 1865 and 1870, would have ended these atrocities, but unfortunately they did not. Uh, there was a brief period known as Reconstruction when the freedmen had an opportunity to thrive and pursue their dreams, but Reconstruction ended quite promptly in 1877, after a mere 12 years, uh, when the uh, the rich people and the politicians in the South said, get these troops out of here. They're, they're screwing with our way of life. We need to, you know, so, so the, uh, the Reconstruction ended in 1877, uh, which began the, uh, the Jim Crow period, which lasted for about another hundred years. And many of the newly freed uh, slaves wound up working as sharecroppers for their former enslavers in a system that differed very little from slavery, just had a different name. Jim Crow laws were the state and local laws introduced in the southern states in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that enforced racial segregation. The term Jim Crow was a derogatory name for an African American. Such laws remain in effect until the 1960s. The Jim Crow era was marked by great violence inflicted on African Americans. Lynching was common. There was also the period when the former, con this was also the period when the former Confederate states celebrated their lost cause by erecting monuments to their heroes and as a constant reminder and reinforcement of their white supremacist ideology. 1896's Plessy versus Ferguson decision uh, sort of enshrined the whole concept of separate but equal and uh, that reinforced segregation and schools in the south and often up here in the north were, were segregated and unfortunately rarely equal. In the early 20th century, riots, most famously in Greenwood, Florida, which has done some restitution since then, um, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, which has not, um, wiped out entire successful black communities with little, of any, if any, prosecution of the white rioters. But things started looking up in the 1960s. Even after the very positive benefits of 1954's Brown v. Board of Education decision, the 64 Civil Rights and the 1965 Voting Rights Acts, African Americans were still subject to less obvious but nonetheless real discrimination. After World War II, uh, the GI Bill, which should theoretically have leveled the playing field for, for all of the, uh, the troops coming back from, from saving the world from... Um, Unfortunately, the, all those benefits were locally managed, so they were still subject to the discrimination and, and segregation and, and, and um, restrictions of the white masters. From the 1930s until the 1960s, restrictive covenants were used to prevent blacks from moving into white neighborhoods. At the same time, the mortgage and real estate industry practiced redlining steering African-American families to less desirable areas, 
Furthermore, lending for real estate was overtly discriminatory with banks refusing to offer blacks traditional mortgages, forcing would-be homeowners to endure the treachery known as buying on contract. If you're not familiar with buying on contract, I would refer you to Tennessee Coates' seminal article in The Atlantic from June of 2014 called The Case for Reparations. And that's really where I started, really got my first interest in this, in this su subject. But buying on contract meant you gave a down payment for an overvalued piece of property so that the, the, the people with the money would buy a piece of property. They would uh, probably double the cost and resell it to a black family in a, in a shaky neighborhood. Uh, they would ask for a big down payment up front. Um, and then if you missed a payment or were late on a payment, not only would you not have any equity in your property, you would also lose your down payment and be evicted from your, from your house. And this was all done <coughs> according to the law. It was all du jour. Uh, I, I highly recommend Tennessee Coates' article. It's, 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 it's really, it, it's, it's painful at times, but it's, 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 it's good, important information. Um, because of the restrictions on owning real estate, That was a major contributor to the remarkable nine or ten to one discrepancy between white and black uh, wealth in this country. <coughs> so in 54, the Brown v. Board of Ed decision declared that segregation in schools, even if supposedly equal, was unconstitution, unconstitutional. The 64 Civil Rights Act barred discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin in public facilities, such as schools, restaurants, theaters, or hotels. It prohibited une unequal application of voter registration requirements, and discrimination in hiring practices was also outlawed uh, because the act established the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to enforce that law. And 65's Voting Rights Act uh, prohibited discrimination in voting. That act has been men amended five times <coughs> and recently eviscerated by decisions in the Supreme Court that limited its, uh, its scope and reach. The Fair Housing Act in 60, Fair Housing Act in 68 prohibited discrimination in sale and the sale, rental, and financing of housing. So they finally ended the redlining um, process and, uh, and gave and leveled the playing field for the ownership of, of real estate for African Americans. And <coughs> I find it remarkable that it wasn't until literally last year that lynching, uh, which was in extended to include um, rape and, and bodily harm, uh, was turned into a federal hate crime in this country with the Emmett Till Act, which passed both houses of the, of the Congress and was signed by Biden in 22, just last year. So as I said, the time is now. Uh, despite all these legislative, judicial, and constitutional advancements, we still have 400 years of compounded harms in need of healing. This means 246 years of legal, or de jure, slavery from 1619 to 1865. <coughs> 100 years of Jim Crow, which uh, translates to peonage, sharecropping, black codes, prison labor, redlining, contract sales instead of mortgage borrowing, lynching, uh, intimidation by people with hoods and white, white sheets, <coughs> etc. And uh, since the 60s, we have about 58 years of de facto discrimination continuing to today uh, with substandard education, health care, housing, um, and a war on drugs that has resulted in, a, in the prison industrial complex um, jailing a very high percentage of, of black male youths <coughs> and marring their lives and their, their job records and their resumes for the rest of their lives, preventing them from going into public housing and other things. You know, it's all for, for having a little bit of weed, typically. Uh, economic uh, 
discrimination in terms of discriminatory pay rates and limited access to credit and environmental justice. You don't find wastewater treatment plants in nice neighborhoods. You don't, you, you find them in, in less desirable neighborhoods, uh, factories, things like that. So in total, we have over 40, 400 years of du jour legal and de facto practical or systemic discrimination, oppression, and violence, some of which continues to this very day. Uh, authors such as Professor Randall Robinson and Joy DeGruy uh, write convincingly about the international erasure, pardon me, the intentional erasure of the African culture, languages, religions, traditions, and mores. The slave owners found it necessary to dehumanize the slave to overcome the cognitive dissonance created by the very existence of slavery. <coughs> so the debt, both of these books I, I highly recommend. They're, they're very important books and well worth reading. <coughs> uh, terrorism was endemic throughout the culture of enslavement, starting with being captured and removed from home, family, and community in Africa, and suffering an estimated 15% casualty rate on the march from the continental interior to the slave prisons on the African coast, 15%. Uh, researchers have documented another 12.5% death rate in transit across the Atlantic during the Middle Passage. Uh, they say that roughly 10 million slaves came to the New World. That translates between those two sets of casualties and almost 3 million people dying in the process of simply being brought to the United States. And there are estimates that, that numbers, those numbers are, are, are very low and, and actual numbers could be multiples of those which would classify slavery as one of the worst of the atrocities that are on record in history. Um, and what truly are the costs of shattered families and communities, lost freedom, and lost economic power from stolen labor? So, what are the precedents for reparations? Well, here in this country, the uh, Japanese Americans who were in turn during World War II were paid reparations and received an official apology. Uh, the German government has paid, made payments to the state of Israel as well as to uh, individual uh, citizens who were harmed by the Holocaust. The Canadian government fairly recently uh, instituted restitution to ind indigenous children who were removed from their families um, and sent to uh, residential schools and attempt to separate them from their culture and convert them to Christianity. Um, that practice didn't end until the 1990s. Uh, U.S. government compensation of the victims of 9-11. Of Still going on. And then of course we have the wonderful 40 acres and a mule which was talked about but never really implemented uh, during restoration, re during reconstruction. So who pays? To quote William Darity and Kristen Mullen from Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, perhaps this is like the seminal text on, on reparations. <coughs> when the entire political order is complicit, it is not sufficient, this is a quote from there. When the entire political order is complicit, it, complicit it is not sufficient to bill individual perpetrators. Laissez-faire or piecemeal reparations may assuage individual guilt but cannot meet the collective national obligation. The invoice for reparations must go to the nation's government. The U.S. government as the federal authority bears responsibility for sanctioning, maintaining, and enabling slavery, legal segregation, and continued racial inequality. The invoice needs to go to the Congress. And this needs to be kept out of the courts because the courts just don't have the ability to, to deal with it. Um, this is their, their assessment. They uh, have written a newer book, which is called The Black Reparations Project, a handbook on ra for racial justice, uh, which they added another author named Lucas Hubbard to that one. Um, they go into amazing detail. Uh, if, if you look through here, the charts of numbers this is also a very fine print, but the charts of, of uh, I guess that's in the other book. Um, 
Yeah, the, but the detail in both of these books about how they arrived at the numbers they have is, is you know, um, very fine detail. Um, they document their assertion that 14.7 trillion is the number. With 45 million African Americans currently alive and assuming that 90% of them have a direct ancestral connection to slavery, that computes to $357,000 per person. $357,000. Uh, the average wealth gap between black and white Americans accounts for most of this large number, it's estimated to be somewhere around $250,000 is the, the gap between black and white wealth. The remainder is accounted for by disparities in education and income, mass incarceration and its after effects, substandard health care or, or limited access to health care, and limited access to <coughs> small business funding. <coughs> Please note that these valuations do not take into consideration the value of lost freedom. How much would you charge to give away your freedom um, for the nine million survivors of the Middle Passage and their kids? And, um, these valuations do not include compensatory damages for hardship, pain, and suffering for all of the various physical and psychological insults of life and bondage. <coughs> Nor does it include the adjusted for inflation value of the illusory 40 acres and a mule. Furthermore, these valuations do not include the value of the labor which was involuntary extracted from the enslaved. You put all those additional costs or, or valuations into this equation and all of a sudden we're talking about quadrillions of dollars. So in their opinion, 14.7 trillion is a palatable compromise. So aside from money, um, there's another side to this need for reparations, and that has to do with the harms that have been, you know, the psychological traumas and harms that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. <coughs> um, Professor Robinson, um, the debt, uh, What America Owes to Blacks, in his book, he never puts a monetary, he, he actually never puts a monetary value on on the, the size of the debt. His primary thesis declares that blacks have for centuries had their history and culture stripped away. This was done by the slave owners to reinforce their control. <coughs> that erased history is very rich in many ways, not the least of which are medical advances. Believe it or not, they were doing cataract surgery in the 1300s in Africa. Um, astronomical uh, observations. The, uh, the Dogon people, I don't know exactly when this was, but it's probably in the same period, uh, long before C Copernicus, and <laughs> um, they correctly identified the planets circling distant stars. They, they were paying that much attention. Um, and mathematics that were developed by the Moors, and uh, uh, the, the establishment of reading and writing and libraries at least 7,000 years ago. So the entire world would benefit from recentering this foundational world history for, for all of us to know more about Africa and, and what came out of Africa. Dr. DeGruy in the post-traumatic slave syndrome takes a more personal look at this and she says, since the injury from intergenerational trauma, intergenerational trauma occurred on multiple levels, it follows that we need to heal in multiple ways and on multiple levels. Any level of healing the first requires an accurate assessment of the damage that has been impacted, that has impacted the individual, the family, and the community, and the society. As I said, hers is a more intimate, personal, and familial concern. Uh, we as individuals must consistently reach higher and live speaking as a black woman to her black community. She says, we as individuals must consistently reach higher and live better by taking advantage of the lived experience within our communities and the opportunities afforded us by higher education. Families are responsible for the foundation from which offspring can build their own unique experiences. And communities must support families. Go back to Hillary Clinton, it takes a village. It's, it's, it's quite true. Uh, we have to apply what we have learned from those that have come before us and couple it with the best information and technology available now to, to establish new habits for better living. She suggests that simply having 
a shared family meal on a daily basis would be a really good start. She says that to recover from the healing includes healing from past injuries, building self-esteem, taking control of our inner world, especially anger management, uh, calling out and fighting stereotypes, um, and telling the truth about the world by navigating the perils of our society most deeply rooted of our society's most deeply rooted discriminatory practices and still manage to succeed. <coughs> Selling, uh, setting good examples and under, understanding the importance of developing a strong family narrative, of telling our story. And these are things that, that because they don't know the stories, large portions of the African American community are not able to tell those stories. This fellow, John McWhorter, who's uh, a little bit more on the conservative side, um, talks about what he calls three planks as ways that the African American community can, that we can help to save the African American community. Um, he never actually makes any anti-reparation statements, but his thinking is that the best way to resolve the lingering problems <coughs> is to make long-term commitments to what he calls three planks. Um, number one is, the en is ending the war on drugs. Um, if we eliminate the black market for drugs, we thereby encourage people to find legal work, and that as a result, we keep people out of jail. So ending the war on drugs would be very beneficial to, to the the poor community. And he, he extends this to not just blacks, but also to the, the rest of the poor. Um, teaching reading properly. So evidently there are two schools, two ways of teaching reading. Um, phonics is one of them, and the other is called the whole word method. And most curricula in most schools ascribe to the whole word method, uh, because when you have Middle class kids coming from book line homes often manage to guess their way into learning how to read by something like the whole word method. But phonics has been un unanimously demonstrated to be more effective at teaching poor kids to read. So we need to, uh, and whole generations of black kids disproportionately poor have been sideswiped by inadequate reading instruction. Anti racism should be centered in part on making school boards across America embrace phonics. Phonics means you can, you can sound out a word. You can look, look at the letters and sound it out, and then all of a sudden, oh, that's what they're talking about. Um, we also have to get past, his third point, third blank is that we have to get past the idea of everyone going to college. We must revise the notion that attending a four-year college is the mark of being a legitimate American and return to truly valuing working class jobs. People can make a solid living as electricians, plumbers, hospital technicians, cable TV installers, body shop mechanics, and many other jobs, to quote McWhorter. So emphasizing vocational training as well as, as scholastic training. So more recently, in an op-ed he wrote for the Times, Mr. McWhorter uh, almost reluctantly <laughs> seems to have come out in favor of reparations. So he says, uh, he says he can now get behind reparations. He said, I have never been a fan of the idea of reparations. He believes that black Americans have deserved reparations, but feels that welfare, affirmative action, and certain banking reforms um, are already forms of reparations. So he can support these newer reparations in the form of housing assistance as a means of bridging the wealth gap that's more acceptable than direct cash payments. And I think he makes a good point there. So he's open to experiments in this new conception of reparations. Um, so when I was asked to give this presentation, I was asked to talk about the other side of the coin and, and some of the arguments against reparations. So um, the, uh, the, the De Darity and McMullen and, and Hubbard um, have cited a few examples of, of rationales that are offered or excuses for not paying reparations. Um, a, the first one is tracing wealth over generations is too complex. We can send people to the moon, but we can't do a little bit of math. 
B, no original perpetrators or victims are alive today. C, there is no precedent for compensating descendants for the losses of ancestors. Well, they go on to say, oh, and D, ab abolition somehow provided compensation for slavery. So the authors go on to say that providing counterexamples for po points A through C is easy and uh, done admirably in the text. And part, point D, the discontinuing of an injustice is not the same as compensating for its lasting intergenerational effects. Um, the, uh, in, in 2019, CNN quoted then Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell as opposing payment of reparations for slavery, arguing, I, I don't think reparations for something that has happened 150 years ago for whom none of us currently living are responsible is a, a good idea. Uh, we've tried to deal with, in, in, in my voice now, <laughs> uh, we tried to deal with our original sin of slavery by fighting a civil war, by passing landmark civil rights legislations, and we even elected an African-American president. I think we're always at a work in progress in this country, but no one currently alive was responsible for that, and I don't think we should try to figure out how to compensate for it, he said. First of all, it'd be pretty hard to figure out who to compensate. We've had waves of immigrants as well come to this country and experience dramatic discrimination of one form, one kind or another. So I don't think reparations are a good idea. I don't know if you noticed how he managed to conflate voluntary immigration with involuntary slavery. Perhaps the most compelling argument against reparations is the fear of the backlash from the aggrieved subset of the white Americans. Uh, once thought to be no longer active in modern society, these groups became vocal again after the election of, of President Obama, uh, our first African-American president. Uh, if you remember the Tea Party demonstrations and the resurgence, of, um, amazing, the resurgence of the John Birch Society, all venting both subtle and more overt racism. Uh, in more recent times, the candidacy of uh, Donald Trump seem to ignite more reactionary segments of the white nationalist movement. And today these groups are openly and aggressively demonstrating their grievances to anyone who will listen. <coughs> and they're amplifying them on social media and being very aggressive about recruiting um, and with a lot of assistance from the online platforms themselves in terms of anything that's more salacious or, or <coughs> aggrieved or angry tends to get pushed up in the, by the algorithms. And in his, uh, this, these tendencies are, are well documented in this brand new book by uh, Wesley Lowry, who is a pro Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the Washington Post uh, called American White Lash, A Changing Nation on the Cost of Progress. Um, he documents these, these concerns about, about the, the angry white people. So, um, I think we have time to do this. I'd like to share with you a look at the reparations report from California. There we go. Screen. There we go. So this this literally was published um, at the very end of June. So this is all brand new information, and this is the 74-page executive summary of the 1,080-page report. <coughs> um, I'm not going to read all this. Um, I, I, I highlighted a bunch of it, but we've already, I, I want to allow time for, for, for discussion and questions. So, um, but they talk about the fact that something like uh, 12 of the first 21 presidents of the United States were slave owners. Um, and is, is my scrolling 
making anyone seasick or is it? Is it uh, uh, okay, good. Um, there are lots of cool little things they point out here about how the slave codes, you know, well, we'll, we'll go through it. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but they talk about enslavement. They talk about um, the fact that in California there were roughly 1,500 enslaved, which was a free state, by the way. But uh, there were already slaves there when, when California joined the, the Union. <coughs> and the, the, the people in charge didn't do anything to free them or they, they allowed that to continue. Um, and California did not ratify the 14th Amendment until 1959. And they didn't ratify the 15th Amendment about voting until 1962. Uh, we talk about racial terror. As I said, we're not really going to dwell on that today. Um, political disenfranchisement, which is still going on today with, you know, congressional districts being redrawn and, and making it harder for people to vote, um, mostly African Americans and other people of color. Uh, segregation and housing. Um, this, these are maps showing the redlining uh, districts in uh, Oakland, California, the neighborhoods that you could buy in if you were, if you were black, but that you had to stay away from, and other neighborhoods you would stay, be, be kept away from if you were black. Uh, separate and unequal edu education. They cite a st statistic <coughs> saying that 23 billion less is spent on predominantly black districts than the white districts. White districts. Um, we've already talked about in environment and the infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, I didn't mention that uh, one of the the, uh, the whole urban renewal concept that was uh, promoted by Robert Moses and others were ways of breaking up um, African-American communities and successful ones. Uh, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life, stolen labor and hindered opportunity, an unjust legal system. Uh, it goes on and on. Mental and physical harm and neglect. Um, five times more African-American men in California die of prostate cancer than, than white. Um, the wealth gap. They're, they're saying here it's nine times that white households have nine times more, ac more assets than black households. Um, this is where we had learned about the international reparations framework that I started off talking about. Um, satisfaction can take the form of a con commendatory judgment or the acknowledgement of truth as well as the acknowledgement of responsibility and fault. So we, we, we have to own up to this. Uh, and examples of other repertory efforts, okay, uh, they talk about Germany and uh, a lot of the other, uh, uh, Chile, uh, South Africa, apartheid, actually um, Robin, Randall Robinson was, was instrumental in helping to end apartheid. He, he, he was good friends with uh, Matt Nelson Mandela. Uh, Canada for the, the Indian children. Uh, domestic reparations movement here in the United States. Um, um, Frederick Douglass was calling for this a long time ago. <coughs> Indians Commission. So it goes on and on. Tuskegee, the, the syphilis, syphilis experiments that were done. Uh, after, well, it was started before penicillin came out, but they were continued long after penicillin came out without administering any penicillin. Um, it just goes on and on and on. It's, it's a wonderful report. Um, they talk about the reparations in Rosewood, Florida, where they've actually made payments to actually funded education in the name of reparatory <coughs> efforts for the the destruction of that community back in the 1920s. Um, apparently there was some eugenics program in Virginia, uh, mass sterilization programs in California, the famous Chicago Police Department, and there's another article here which was written by Jill Lepore uh, about three years ago. Actually, when, when, when we were all dealing with George Floyd and, and defunding the police. 
she wrote this really, really good article about um, the invention of the police. And basically, police, modern police departments are the, what has replaced the squads that went around and collected runaway slaves. So they, they've been dealing with, Afri you know, basically working only on African Americans for a long time. So, um, so they recommend for a California, they make a recommendation for an apology, an official apology from California. And then they make some calculations of reparations. And this is uh, also more detail that we're going to go into. We don't have time for today. <coughs> but um, others have t totaled the work that was done by this, this committee and uh, arrived at a, an amount of $1.2 million per person um, to, for the California residents. So I, I think I'm going to wrap it up at this point. There's, there's more here, but we're running out of time. I want to allow for questions. Um, I do have one final thought as in conclusion. Um, Are you done sharing? Yes, we can stop sharing. So uh, it was suggested um, when I undertook this assignment that I should not take a position on the matter, um, that I should simply present the arguments. <coughs> Um, the more I learned, the clearer the moral imperatives became. Um, this is not about assigning blame. This is, this is not about, you know, uh, it's about making right a wrong. Um, and there's no getting around the fact that this was and continues to be a systemic problem. <coughs> as, rep as the reparations movement, <coughs> a reparations movement based on unbiased education about the centuries-long history of enslavement and its brutal aftermath, and a curriculum that restores the absolutely foundational importance of the ancient civilizations of Africa might begin to take, make a taste for certain types of cash reparations more palatable for those who might otherwise oppose it. Regardless, I do not think we should allow, we should allow fear to dictate the direction this conversation must take. So, thank you. Oh, I have a reading list here, which I'll also, oh, I closed my laptop. Um, so you guys can help yourselves. I, I probably didn't make enough copies, sorry. Jim. Yeah, well, hold on. Uh, just microphone. Yeah. yeah, I need the mic, and we are. Um, it's on the end of the, uh, Oh, here we go, no? thank you. It's right here, oh. right here, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that talk. Certainly important. and definitely important at this time. And when you say the time is now, I was sick this morning when I opened the New York Times and read how in Florida they approved the curriculum, this new curriculum for their schools, which is just outrageous, claiming that um, blacks benefited from slavery. They learn skills. This is in our curriculum. And um, it's in the Times this morning, and it just truly made me sick. So. Yes, the time is now, I agree with that. So with that, um, I will take questions and we will again alternate between the room and Zoom. We'll begin with two questions. Come. Yeah, we, okay. we, we, the room is needed by 12, so we don't have yeah. a lot of time. I apologize for going so, being so long-winded. Yeah, well, we have, we <coughs> have a good 10 minutes. So I do ask that in the interest of time and to, to um, give those who want to speak an opportunity that you kind of limit your questions to one minute um, or comment. So, Jim, do you want to come up or do you want to take this? Great talk. Thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I just want to recommend one additional book that Orion didn't mention. Um, in order for the, 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 the let bygones be bygones argument can be quite comforting to some people. But in order for it to have any traction at all, you ha have to be confident that the by bygones really are gone by. Uh, and if you want to read a book that ca catalogs how they are not gone by, 
There's a book by a, an author named Douglas A. Blackmon called Slavery by Another Name. And he makes a very well-documented, compelling argument that slavery in its initial form simply morphed into a more subtle form which continues to this very day. And I really recommend that book um, to understand that you can't let bygones be bygones because they are not gone by. Thanks, Jim. Indeed. Thanks. Uh, we'll take one more question, uh, comment from the, from the room before we go to Zoom. Yeah. I have something that you can do right now. There is a reparations task force in New Jersey committee. It's in committee for three years and it hasn't moved. It's number A938. Write your or contact your legislator and tell them to get it out of committee and into a vote. Thank you. Are you on our social action committee? No, I'm on the she is now. now she is. Can you please be on our social action committee? You can leave that. <laughs> please. <laughs> Thanks. That's really important. I was I was not aware of that. Um, yeah, yeah we, we have to talk about that in our committee. Um, and now I will turn it over to two from Zoom. Very good. And Eric? we have. Thank you. And we have Eric Young from Philadelphia with his hand raised. And then we have some other questions uh, in the chat. But go ahead, uh, Eric, please unmute yourself. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Um, great presentation. Thank you. I'm part of a number of groups um, in COBRA, and I put that in the chat, the National Coalition of uh, Blacks for Reparations in America. And also, I recommend a 10-point platform uh, by the NA. RC, the National African American Reparations Committee. Um, and again, I, the question of reparations and money is interesting um, because money is a, a part of it. Um, but I think what, looking at what Illinois City and Evanston is doing because they have just handed out rep uh, money and vouchers. So they were, I'm looking to see how they've already handed it out. And it's going to come in different forms. And that's what I think, again, we have to, it's going to be a multi level um, program. And so keep an eye on Illinois City um, and uh, articles by Stacey M. Brown. But I just want to ask people, please note that um, we have a number of African-American historians and real people with credibility uh, that are part of the community. My only thing about people like McCorder and those is that they are not part of the African-American community. So spending a lot of time with them is, you know, we have to be careful of, uh, of, of people like that who are, um, uh, so again, we have a number of African American historians and people of color and people of uh, allies who I think we need to pay attention to have more credibility. But it will be an ongoing program. And again, all these arguments, I would just say, were the same used in uh, post-war Germany, um, where a majority of the people of Germans were not in favor of giving reparations to Jews. So this is nothing new. Um, and that history will help us be better prepared for it may come down in America. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Eric. One more from Zoom before we turn so to So I'm going to read a question that was posted by uh, Jim Tusson. Uh, and that, unless Jim is still on and wants to raise his hand and ask it himself. By the way, these questions are available in the chat. So as we uh, uh, record this, I think you should be able to see these uh, questions if you want to look at them. Has the, uh, his question is, has there been any consideration or study on establishing a national foundation for repatriations or reparations funded by private court contributions? This would allow those who believe reparations are a priority to support them while recognizing that others may wish to direct their resources to other causes. It would also avoid the divisiveness of using taxpayer dollars while insulating the program from administrations and congresses that may be hostile to reparations. So again, the question is, what about private initiatives, including a private foundation uh, to provide uh, this type of redress? Orion? I don't really have an answer for that question. Uh, yeah. I've been focused more on history and, and that stuff. Um, I'll be happy to look into it though. Thank you. David? Okay. 
Thank you. Um, two more comments. Mark? I was just wondering about the distinction between the concept of reparations and other, uh, or how, how do you define reparation and in terms of, is it, does it, uh, is, it the have to, is it a monetary payment or you were talking about a voucher or could it be some institutional reforms that favor a particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I don't think there's a consensus on that. Um, there clearly are people who want to look at it as dollars and cents. Um, I think one of the most compelling arguments can be towards um, eliminating the wealth gap between blacks and whites in this country. Um, and you know that number is $250,000 per person, something like that. Um, I, I like the idea of, of making that a real estate type transaction more than a cash transaction uh, because then you will actually develop real wealth and, and intergenerational wealth. Um, and, and don't underestimate the psychological component of all this because that's, that's a very real part of it. It's a very real part of it. Yes? Oh, microphone. They can't hear you on Zoom. Thank you. The psychological component is very important because what's happening in the healthcare system with black women dying more often than white women in, uh, in giving birth in this country that we're not first in the world, we're like 10th uh, in the world as far as our healthcare is concerned. And uh, there is a story of how it compounds itself. I have a black friend who lives in my neighborhood in uh, Florida and a mutual friend had asked her to go to her apartment and please send her something from the, the apartment. So she called me and said, I can't go into that apartment by myself because I'm black. Now give me a break, you know, this is not over. So I had to go with her. It's racism that we have to think about. I would love to take more questions and comments on, on this, but we are running out of time. Okay. And um, so, did you have a question or comment? And then we'll end with that, and then I have a comment. A comment. Uh, very quickly, uh, I was just going to say that uh, there was another gift, cultural gift, referring back to Ron and the music that the African people gave to us when they were brought over here in chains, which was what they had here. And what they had here was a certain rhythmical aspect to their music, which they made, it was one of the few things they could do when they were enslaved here, was their sound and their music. And what they ultimately gave us 400 years afterward was coming up to the, the late 40s and 50s when Elvis Presley was the first white guy to wiggle his hips <laughs> and bring their music to the white people. And it was picked up by, wow, oh, this is great stuff, you know, and everybody, you know, it, it became, jazz became America's only original musical art form. And thank you for that, and this is what we gave them. Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and they, and, and look at all the millions of dollars our white musicians made from stealing their music. And Elvis got his start from really the black churches um, you know, having lived in a uh, black neighborhood. I just want to end because Mark's question, I think, um, is, is a good one. You know, it's hard to understand ex exactly how this is done. And you alluded to Manhattan Beach, and I really, I, I need to talk about that because it's, um, my son lives, lives in Redondo Beach, very close to Manhattan Beach, so we spend a lot of time there. And about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, I went for a walk, um, 
long walk, and I came across this beautiful park overlooking the ocean called Bruce's Park. And I sat on the bench, and I, I just, it was just beautiful. And I happened to come across a small plaque that talked about the history of Bruce's Park. And um, I'm just going to read from the article real briefly, then we will end. Um, and maybe, Ron, while I'm doing this, if you could collect, um, pass the basket for the collection, because we are running short of time, so I'm going a little out of order here. But um, Manhattan Beach, I think, is a beautiful example of reparations and the government taking charge of it. And thank you to Gavin Newsom, who took a lead on this, along with the Manhattan Beach governing body, which, which by the way, the average, the average income of a Manhattan Beach resident is $170,000 annual income. The average price of a house in Manhattan Beach, the average price of a house, $3.3 million. Oh. Okay, that's Manhattan Beach. Um, so Manhattan Beach did this reparations. And basically what this Guardian article says is California governor apologizes for city seizure of first West Coast resort for black people which almost certainly would have make, made ears millionaires. So in 1912, the Bruce family bought land in Manhattan Beach. This was in 1912. They were not permitted to go to beaches. There were no integrated beaches. It was all white beaches. So he, he had some, I think he was, might have been a doctor. And um, he opened a resort, an all black beach resort which was the beach I was overlooking from Bruce, Bruce's Park. And there was a two block area where um, black families lived. This was in 1912. Um, and all these black families suffered terrible violence and racism. And in the early 1920s, their land was seized under eminent domain and all the property was taken from them. Hence, now the property around there, if you know Manhattan Beach, $3.3 million homes. So um, Manhattan Beach, um, along with the governor, um, paid back the descendants of the Bruce family. They gave them back the park. So now they owned this park. This just happened two, like two years ago. And um, the family then made a decision to sell it back to Manhattan Beach for, I think, one and a half million dollars. I think they could have done a lot better. But um, anyway, and this went to the great-great-grandchildren of the Bruce family. So I think that, in my mind, is an excellent example of reparations and what California, the state of California, is doing. So I think, you know, government bodies can take this, this mm -hmm. step. Um, so with that. Great, before you quit, I yeah. want to just point out that I've posted my reading list in the chat section of uh, Zoom as well. Um, and if I, I only. I didn't expect such a big crowd today. I only brought 10 or 12 copies with me, but anyone wants this list, just send me an email. I'll get it to you. Yeah. And um, on behalf of Social Action Committee, um, I want to thank everybody. Orion, I want to thank you for this wonderful presentation and enlightenment. And To learn more about us, visit our website, ethicalfocus.org, or email us at admin at ethicalfocus.org, and we'll get back to you. To make a donation, go to ethicalfocus.org slash donate. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and you can watch many of our past programs on our YouTube channel.